Well, church, as I was praying into what to share with you today, I uh, went through a, a gamut of different uh, passages of scripture, uh, different thoughts, and, uh, and then finally came back to just today and uh, the kind of environment that we are in. These are extremely difficult days, isn't it? These are days when we find that we are uh, stretched in, in many ways. Um, we look around us at uh, social media, newspapers, uh, at WhatsApp messages, uh, whatever, and we see just pictures of uh, sickness and death and hopelessness, helplessness all around us. We see videos uh, showing uh, many people waiting to be buried or cremated. We see reports of shortage of oxygen and ventilators and all of that. And, and also we, we're finding, isn't it, that it's not out there. It's really knocking on our own doors now. Suddenly it's in our backyard, well, in our front front doors, isn't it? Knocking, coming into our homes and uh, we are experiencing this virus uh, in our own environments. And I just thought today we are caring for sick. Caregivers are stretched. We are burying our, our dead And no longer do we do we hear skeptics ask, isn't it? Have you heard of anybody who has had COVID, who you know? And I remember these were questions that were being asked earlier. Those questions have absolutely no meaning, isn't it? They're laughable questions today because of what has happened. And yet the question that faces us, you and me today is, how do we navigate through these times? How do we move through these times with a certain amount of equanimity, a certain amount of balance? How do we face every day with hope? How do we get over sadness and grief how do we overcome loneliness and all of these things that we are facing? And I think the most important question in all of this is how do we keep our faith? And not just keep our faith, but keep a, a vibrant faith. Because as Paul writes, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. That's important, isn't it? That as we navigate, go through these days, that our faith is intact. Because as I look around, so many are having a difficult time believing. Believing in, in God, believing in, in the things that we took for granted finding themselves stretched in terms of prayer. How do we pray? What do we pray for? And faith is taking a beating these days. And so I thought we'll just spend a little time today and ask ourselves the question, how do I keep my faith in time? How do I keep a vibrant faith in times like these? And for that, I thought we'll go to uh, Genesis and uh, just look at the life of Joseph and see whether we can in, in some way be able to glean from him and the way in which he lived his life, learn some things from him. 
it's too large a passage of scripture for us to read through because right from chapter 37 where we see Joseph come into the into the narrative right till the end of Genesis uh, we see him so that's a, a lot of chapters and so I'm going to actually lean on Leona Leiko Galal who put together kind of a timeline uh, for us about Joseph and just go through that and lay the groundwork for us to then spring off of his life and ask the question how did Joseph maintain his faith at a vibrant level all through the things that he went through what did he go through well, he was 17 when he was sold into Egypt. So in prison, actually from the age of 17 up till 30. He was 30 when he was made overseer over all of Egypt. He was 39 when his brothers first came to Egypt. The second year of the famine or nine years after being made overseer. He was probably 41 or so when the brothers came a second time and Jacob himself came to Egypt and he was 110 when he died. Let's flesh it out a little bit. He was favored by Jacob because of his heart and because he was a child of Jacob's old age. This, as many of us know, caused his 10 brothers, excluding Benjamin, the youngest, to be very very jealous of Joseph. They resented their father's favor to him so much so that they decided to kill him. And when Joseph came to check on his brothers, as his father asked him to do, they already plotted in their hearts evil against him, even as they saw him walking towards them. Reuben saved Joseph from death, although he left him in the hole. Uh, and then he was sold to the Ishmaelite traders and then deception entered, isn't it? Because they took his coat of many colors that his father had lovingly given to him, soaked it in animal blood and took it back and told their father that he had died, causing such immense grief and yet not even bothering about the kind of grief that they were causing their father. So Joseph was taken to Egypt at the age of 17, hungry, tired, alone. He was told, sold as a slave. Think about his situation. Think about how we might handle this. How we too would look at ourselves in a situation where we are abandoned at a young age or maybe even at the age that we are in. And yet we read that Joseph did not curse God, continued in his prayer, cried out to God, always worshipping him and trusting him. And then we know that he got a job with uh, Potiphar and uh, how he was blessed in that job until Potiphar's wife cast her eye upon uh, Joseph, wanted him to sleep with her and how he refused, remained faithful to God and loyal to Potiphar. And then she was so angry uh, when he refused that she caught all of his garment and kept it screaming that he had raped her and Joseph finds himself in prison. But we read that even in prison, he prospered, he bloomed. And it's a good uh, thought for us, isn't it? That wherever Joseph went, he bloomed, even in times of adversity, because of his trust in God, he allowed God to use him so that he kept prospering. And in prison, Two of Pharaoh's uh, servants find themselves there, the butler and the baker, and they have dreams. And uh, Joseph interprets those dreams that one of them will live, one will die, and the baker loses his life, just as he had said. And then he tells the butler, don't forget me when you are freed. But he does, he forgets Joseph, until Pharaoh has a dream. And then he remembers Joseph who had helped interpret his own dream and so then Joseph is brought and then Joseph then interprets Pharaoh's dream. He gives the correct interpretation and Pharaoh is so impressed that he puts Joseph in charge of Egypt, second only to himself. And Joseph knew that a great famine was coming because God had given him insight by the interpretation of dreams that uh, 
Pharaoh had, and he prepared, and all the skills that he learned while in prison enabled him to organize and to store vast amounts of grain. And then finally, we read the famine hit, and all Egypt went to Joseph to buy grain. This made the Pharaoh even wealthier. All people came from all over the Middle East to buy grain, including Joseph's brothers. They came and eventually were reunited, forgiven, and the family moved to Egypt to reside in the land of Goshen. And then the Jews were there for 400 years. What an incredible account, isn't it? What an incredible story of a man who went through all kinds of adversity, difficult situations, being disliked by his brothers, being taken and thrown into a pit, sold to Ishmaelites, even then living a life of integrity with Potiphar and then finding himself thrown in prison because he refused the advances of Potiphar's wife. Languishing there and yet keeping his faith in God and then finally being placed second only to Pharaoh. All through it, Joseph could have said, I kept the faith. Beloved, we are today going through incredibly difficult times. I, I cannot even imagine what some of you are going through. I don't know your situation, situations, but I do know that sickness and ill health and death have visited you, that hard times are upon so many that you are stretched beyond the resources that you seem to have emotionally, physically. These are difficult times and maybe the last thing on your mind itself is about how do I live a life of faith. And yet, beloved, I think that we must, we must pay attention. We must pay attention to how we live through this time. For these are defining moments for us. So let's just look at Joseph and see maybe a couple of things or maybe three things that we can pull from his life that stand out, that helped him to go through and keep the faith. Number one, I see that his integrity was intact. His integrity was intact. Number two, he didn't allow himself to get bitter. And number three, he forgave the people who wronged him. He didn't carry unforgiveness. Integrity, he didn't compromise on his beliefs. Didn't take advantage of his position, even when he had a high position. He ruled with integrity. Honored the trust that was placed on him and would not dishonor God. When Potiphar's wife came after him, he said, how can I sin against God? I cannot. In the midst of all of this, he maintained his integrity, refused to get bitter. In spite of everything that was happening to him, the mistreatment by his brothers, thrown into jail, even though he was innocent and then even forgotten by people whom he had helped. He refused to get bitter and then was able to forgive in the end, isn't it? So that there was just a happy reunion with his family. So I ask you, beloved, as I've been asking myself, how are we doing during these days? In terms of just these three areas, as we look at our faith and trying to keep our faith vibrant during this time. How are you 
in terms of integrity? Are you standing by your integrity? Are you still standing by your word? Are you still standing by your principles? Are you still uncompromising in your behavior? Are all of these areas still non-negotiable? Or, beloved, have you compromised in any of those areas? Philippians 4, 6 invites us to think about certain things, but I was thinking as I read it that it applies even to living a life of integrity to be able to stay true, pure, right, holy, friendly, proper, truly worthwhile and worthy of praise, just following after these things. And the question for us today, as we look at our own lives and the various things that we have been facing, is to ask ourselves, have I managed to keep my integrity intact? And maybe you're saying, well, not really. I've slipped in a area. I've, my word, I've given but haven't kept or a principle that I used to hold sacrosanct. I've, I've just slipped in that area. And I want to encourage you. I don't want today's message to be one of condemnation because the Bible strongly tells us that there is no condemnation to you and I who are in Christ Jesus. But the word can bring conviction. And maybe today is just a, a gentle reminder from the Lord saying, get back to a position of integrity. What's happened has happened, maybe. But go to the Lord and say, Lord, I failed. I slept. I did wrong, Lord. Please forgive me. Help me to get back to living a life of integrity. And beloved, he will. He will. Because this can't be any kind of joy for you, isn't it? On top of going through difficult times to also have this thought hanging over your head that you compromised on something cannot be pleasant. And so, as we go through the sermon, as you find things that are, that need God's touch, take it to Him. So, integrity. How are we doing in terms of integrity? Secondly, are you Harboring any bitterness? Is there any root of bitterness that has crept into your life? Hebrews 12, 15 says, Watch out that no root of bitterness grows up to trouble you. That is, has the pot potential to corrupt many. How are you doing in that area? As you look at the things that are going on, have you allowed yourself to get bitter? Maybe because you couldn't do, help somebody, you couldn't help a family member, you couldn't do enough, or enough was not enough. Or maybe you think, I prayed and nothing happened, and, and now you're just bitter. I remember few years ago, more than a few years, I was in, in Colorado Springs and with a wonderful Christian brother and he wanted me to meet somebody. And so we were sitting in this coffee shop and waiting for this person and, and when this person showed up, I was shocked by his appearance. I had never seen a more grotesque face. And I tried to hide my horror as he sat down and grimaced in what to him was really a smile. And he told me, I'm used to people shocked by my appearance. And then he said, I used to be a newscaster for sports events. And at the end of one of these events, I was lighting the firecrackers and one went off in my face and 
it just blew my face to sm smashed bones, everything. <clears throat> I said, I've had multiple, multiple reconstructive surgeries on my face and this is the best finally that they could do. But he said more than just the reconstruction of my face was the reconstruction of my thoughts in my mind. Because he said, I went through day after day just taking in the bitterness. He says, one day I walked into this hospital and I met this nurse and she came and she looked at me and she said, you know, there are only two things that happen in this hospital. You either get better or you get bitter and you decide which one. Beloved, maybe today you're bitter about the things that have happened Things that you had no control over but happened anyway. And you're blaming yourself maybe. You're angry that you didn't have what it took. I don't know. But I wonder whether there's a root of bitterness that has the potential to corrupt. I love this quote by Maya Angelou. She says, Bitterness is cancer. It eats upon the host. It doesn't do anything to the object of its displeasure. It's so true, isn't it? It doesn't do anything for the situation that has happened. Nothing. It's only eating into you and me. And so maybe today is the day that you deal with that bitterness and say, Lord, I have allowed bitterness to come and take root in my heart and I want to get rid of it Lord it's just eating me it's consuming me it's making me a angry negative person that nobody wants to be around maybe God is saying will you give me your bitterness today let me pour the sweetness of my spirit into that area And then thirdly, beloved, forgiveness. Joseph didn't carry around unforgiveness. He was able to forgive his brothers and there was such a happy reunion, isn't it? And I wonder whether as you look at just these last maybe year, year and a half, whether there are events that have transpired Things that people have done to you, said to you, either by family or friends or colleagues that have harmed you, hurt you. And you've vowed to yourself, I'll never forgive them. And as I was putting this together, I was reminded of the Lord's prayer, isn't it? Forgive us our trespasses as we Forgive those who trespass against us. That's the call, hard as it may be. And I know that these are hard words to one who has been hurt. And yet for us to recapture a vibrant faith, unforgiveness, beloved, has no place in our lives. And it has to be an act of the will. It cannot be that you're saying, I'll wait for somebody to be sorry. No. Forgiveness is just letting that person who wronged you go. Not that you excuse the behavior, but that you're saying, I'm not going to let that behavior continue to control who I am or my response to what happened. I'm letting that go. That is part of my history. I cannot in any way erase that. And maybe I'll learn from that. But I'm not going to carry that person around wherever I go, which is how somebody described it. I wonder whether there are people who have hurt you, beloved, who you haven't forgiven. I wonder whether today the Lord would be saying to you, let go. Let go. 
It's not doing you any good. It's only going to stand in the way of your own faith. Paul said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And I kept the faith. Beloved, that's what we need to be doing during these days, is keeping the faith. Keeping the faith. Having a vibrant, vibrant faith even during these days, clinging to the Lord and saying, I will not let you go. To you, to you alone will I cling because you are my only hope. You are my anchor. You are the lighthouse. I cannot let you go. I will not let you go. Do what it takes. Look at my lives in terms of integrity and bitterness and unforgiveness. Do what you need to do in my heart, Lord Jesus. But... I'm going to cling to you because you're the only one I have who can help me to go through. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Isn't it? As the songwriter says, and we, that's we, where we must be, beloved. So let's search our hearts. Make sure that our connection to God is strong during these days. Make sure that we haven't given a foothold to Satan where we have compromised or where there's a little bitterness or unforgiveness. And make sure that we haven't lost our joy. The joy of living, even in these days, to be able to live with joy. And then to make sure, as Joseph did, to bloom even in this situation, even in these days, even in these desperate times, beloved. And so I urge you today, don't give up. Don't give in. Stay the course. Cling to the Lord. Make sure that prayer and Bible study and worship are integral comp components of your day. And let's make sure, beloved, that even through these days, we have a vibrant faith. And that we can say, even though we are not at the end, that we are keeping the faith. Keeping the faith. May God help us. Shall we pray? Oh, loving, holy God. Whom do we have but you? And to you we come. Lord, in all of these things that are happened, we've not had time even to look at our lives and see what's going on maybe, to do introspection. But today, turn the spotlight on us. Show us where we have compromised. Show us where we have a root of bitterness. <clears throat> Show us, Lord, if we have not forgiven anybody. Lord, help us to hold on to you, hold on to us, Master. Help us to have a faith that is vibrant even in these tumultuous times. Lord, let your presence fill every room, every heart where people are listening. Touch each one, Master, with the power of your Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.